Harper Audio presents There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem. Written and read by Wayne W. Dyer. I completed the initial stage of this program on the 15th of June, 2000, at our home on Maui. It was a wonderful sense of accomplishment. I enjoyed the summer with my family, swimming, hiking, and playing tennis. We had dinners and movies with close friends and precious free time to read and share intimate moments, especially with my wife, Marceline, who was so instrumental in helping me find a spiritual solution to the problem I was about to experience. Little did I realize that in a few short months, I would be called upon to test those principles for a spiritual solution to every problem firsthand in my own life. In the autumn of 2000, I was literally brought to my knees while alone in a hotel room. I could barely breathe. My chest felt like it was in a vice. I was sweating profusely and soon was informed that I had had a heart attack. But something was dreadfully wrong with this picture. I don't smoke or drink. I'm not overweight. I exercise every day, and I've done so for over 25 years. I watch what I eat, I meditate, I do what I love, and I love what I do. I have a great marriage, I have wonderful children. I don't do heart attacks. That's for other people who live their lives in such a way as to invite in heart attacks, not me, not Dr. Wayne Dyer. Yet there I was, in the hospital, with monitor wires attached all over my upper body, and with an IV in my arm. In three days, I would have an angiogram procedure. For the first 24 hours, I lay there in a state of shock and disbelief. It is called denial. I felt sorry for myself. I refused to acknowledge that such a thing could happen to me. I was, to be honest, scared to death. After that first day, I began to rehash what I had written that you are about to hear. I reminded myself of the title, There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem. And this surely was a problem. I remembered that I could bring the energy of spirit right here to this hospital room. By doing so, I could actually turn this thing around. The facts were the facts. My heart had been injured. Now it was up to me. I am not this body. I am a spiritual being, eternal, always connected to God. I could shift my awareness to being the observer rather than the victim. It was as if the light came on in a room of darkness. I felt the presence of a higher, faster healing energy almost immediately. I began to be cheerful rather than morose. I circulated around the cardiac ward, attempting to cheer up those who were much worse off than myself. I looked for what was right about that place and experienced gratitude for everything my senses witnessed. On Monday morning, the angiogram revealed a blockage in one artery that may have been a part of my physical anatomy since birth. My heart was strong and the damage was minimal. A stent was inserted in the blocked artery after a balloon poked out the offending plaque. I am now back to my normal exercise and work routine. I decided to share this information with you to illustrate how a seemingly insurmountable problem has a spiritual solution readily accessible. It worked. Trust me. I, Wayne Dyer, know from first-hand experience. Can you make a flower grow? Probably your first response is, such a simple thing to do. Plant a seed, provide sunlight and water, and in time, a flower will emerge. However, I am inviting you to consider who or what generates the life that makes a flower grow. Who or what causes the flower seed to blossom and the tiny embryo to become a human being? Who or what grows our fingernails and beats our heart even as we sleep? What is this force that keeps the planets in place and hurls our world through the galaxy at a breathtaking speed? These questions have been asked for as long as humans have had the ability to contemplate their existence. Spirit is what I have chosen to call the invisible energy, which is the source and sustenance of life on this planet. This force, no matter the name we give it, can solve every problem that we encounter. I will begin by explaining the three basic steps to finding your own spiritual solutions to problems. I first read about these steps when I immersed myself in the aphorisms of Patanjali, written sometime between the 4th century B.C. and the 4th century A.D., I will share with you how this knowledge can be applied in your life. You will discover for yourself that these things you have come to label as problems have a solution available to you right now in that world we are calling spirit. Recognizing the availability of an invisible force that can be put to use in solving a problem requires overcoming a great deal of our early training. 
Do you believe there's only one kind of power or knowledge which relies on your sensory or intellectual faculties to solve problems? Most of us have been taught this is true. This is a conditioned attitude of non-recognition of our divine connection. In this state of non-recognition, we believe that medicines, herbs, surgery, and doctors are responsible for all healing, or that improving one's financial picture involves the exclusive application of working hard, studying, and sending out resumes. Patanjali described a kind of knowledge or power that is not accessed solely through the material world. Recognition that this power exists and is always available is the first step of activating it. As physical beings, we can make a flower grow, but if we are thoughtful, we realize that we cannot even begin to unravel the mystery of the invisible force that initiates life. Yet it is in this omnipotent spiritual world that we find the solutions to all of our problems. When we incorporate the first step, recognition, we begin the process of accessing this power. In the second step, we go into the phase of realization, where nothing but our own personal experience is trusted. We become an explorer in virgin territory where no one but ourselves can be. Here, only you can validate your experience. I suggest that you begin this process of realization by visualizing the presence you seek. Create an inner picture of yourself receiving divine guidance and banish all doubts about its validity. You will find that your picture dissolves into the reality of a presence that is accessible within yourself. This is realization. It is a personal experience beyond anything related to an intellectual exercise. With practice and desire and quiet meditation, you will experience this presence. The third step, reverence, is acquired quickly by some people, while for others it can take a long time. Communing quietly with the spiritual force and becoming one with it means there is no sense of separation. In other words, we begin to see ourselves as a part of God. We are in a state of reverence for all that we are. There is a spiritual solution to every problem. I believe the definitions I use for spiritual, problem, and solution can form the basis for a unique way of bringing peace and fulfillment into your daily life. It is my contention that once you internalize these concepts, you will rarely revert to the belief that you face insurmountable problems. I think it is important to see spiritual as a part of physical rather than separate these two dimensions of our reality. It is all one. Spirit represents that which we cannot validate with our senses. The real key to understanding spiritual is this idea of our inner world and our outer world. One world, yet two unique aspects of being human. I have a friend who compares the physical to a light bulb and the spiritual to electricity. When I refer to spiritual, I do not intend it to be synonymous with religious. Religion is orthodoxy, rules, and historical scriptures maintained by people over long periods of time. Generally, people are born into religions and raised to obey the customs and practices of that religion without question. These are customs and expectations from outside of the person and do not fit my definition of spiritual. Spirituality is from within. My personal understanding of spiritual practice is that it is a way of making my life work at a higher level and of receiving guidance. The ways in which I do this involve a few simple but basic practices. I have enumerated them here in my own order of significance. Surrender. This is first because it is the most crucial and often the most difficult. In order to surrender, you must be able to admit to being helpless. In surrender, my thoughts are something like this. I simply do not know how to resolve this situation, and I'm turning it over to the same force that I turn my physical body over to every night when I go to sleep. I'm willing to turn any problem over to this invisible force, which is my source, while keeping in mind that I am connected at all times to that source. In other words, the spiritual life is a way of walking with God instead of walking alone. Love. Activating spiritual solutions means converting inner thoughts and feelings from disharmony to love. I use a metaphor of a long cord that is hanging from my hip, and I have the option of plugging that cord into one of two sockets. When I plug into the material world socket, I receive the illusions of disharmony. I feel out of sorts, hurt, upset, anguished, 
and hopeless in terms of being able to solve or correct my problem. When I am plugged in in this way, I struggle to attain false powers. Defining empowerment only in material world terms is a reflection of being spiritually disconnected. When I imagine this cord being yanked from the material world socket and replugged into the spiritual socket, I immediately experience a sense of peace and relief. I can relax and remember that the spirit is God, which is synonymous with love. Love and love alone dissolves all negativity, much as light dissolves darkness by just its mere presence. The Infinite Awareness of our infinite nature is terrific for putting everything into perspective. When I unplug myself from the material and replug myself into the spiritual, I immediately let go of fear, judgment, and negativity. Infinite love is what I receive from that new energy source. An empty mind. I feel strongly about the need for meditation to nourish the soul and access divine assistance. Beyond the actual act of meditation is a willingness to empty my mind of my agenda and be open to what will inevitably come to me. I relinquish my thoughts to the power that spirit has to make things work. Completely emptying the mind of our agenda leads to forgiveness. Getting to a state of emptiness means ridding ourselves of all blame and all angry thoughts about what has transpired in the past. There is no room for hanging on to who did what and when and how wrong they were. Generosity and gratefulness. Sometimes I feel the necessity to remind myself that we come into this world with nothing and we will exit the same way. So finding a spiritual solution involves doing the only thing I can do with my life. That is, giving it away and being simultaneously grateful for the opportunity to do so. Here's a formula which works for me. I get back from the world precisely what I put out to the world, which is another way of stating the proverb, as you sow, so shall you reap. I recommend your spiritual practice involve being generous and grateful with your thoughts. The more you send out thoughts of how may I serve, rather than what's in it for me, the more you will hear back, how may I serve you. Connectedness. The Sufi poet Rumi once explained that the terms I, you, me, he, she, and they are distinctions that cannot be made in the garden of the mystics. In spiritual consciousness, you view yourself as a flower in this garden and everyone else in the garden connected to you in an invisible way. Our difficulties are something we realize that we share with everyone else. Nurture your sense of connection to everyone and God as well. This allows you to remove your ego from conflicts. This awareness of being a part of everyone allows you to suspend anger toward others and to see them as partners in the resolution of all problems. Know that there are people to whom you are connected who are available to help you find the right job, to solve a puzzling issue that seems irreconcilable, to help you back on your feet, to resolve financial difficulties. Everyone becomes a compatriot rather than a competitor. This is spiritual awareness as I practice it. I try to remind myself in moments of despair of the beautiful affirmation from A Course in Miracles. I can choose peace rather than this. Trust me, it works. And finally, cheerfulness. In terms of outward appearances, there is something noticeable about people who have reached a high level of spiritual awareness. They seem to be in a constant state of bliss. Ask yourself this key question. How do I feel most of the time? If your answer is that you feel anxious, anguished, hurt, depressed, frustrated, and so on, then you have a spiritual disconnect. This could mean you have allowed your personal energy field to become contaminated by the debilitating forces of those in your immediate life space. I often ask myself, how am I truly feeling inside myself these days? If my answer is not so hot or upset, I meditate and go to the quiet place where I can plug my cord into the spiritual outlet. The state of cheerfulness returns almost instantaneously. Every teacher who has been significant in my life has demonstrated this wondrous quality of being able to laugh and to take life lightly. I love Eric Fromm's insight. Man is the only animal that can be bored, who can be discontented, that can feel evicted from paradise. Only you can evict yourself from the garden of paradise. 
That concludes the components of the word spiritual. Now let's take a look at what I mean by the word problem. In my heart, I feel that there is really only one problem for any of us. That is, when we allow ourselves to separate from God. But in a very real sense, we can never be separate from God. Yet, we often still believe that we have problems. The problems of disease, discord, fear, anxiety, scarcity, disappointments in others, and so on, are all in our minds. When we truly reconnect to our source, these feelings disappear. I use the word problem as if it truly exists, yet I know every time I use it that it's an illusion. So every time you hear the word, know that I perceive it as an illusion created by ourselves because we have separated ourselves from God. There's a powerful line in A Course in Miracles which reminds me of this lesson. It takes great learning to understand that all things, events, encounters, and circumstances are helpful. We can learn to view every crisis as an opportunity which wouldn't necessarily make life easier, but would make it more satisfying. We would never be able to view anything as a negative occurrence because we'd see everything as useful. Our conditioning is so strong that we often have far greater faith in our problems than we do in our ability to no longer have them. We often display a much greater faith in the power of cancer or AIDS than we do in the power to heal them. The evil, the pain, the anguish are of our own creation and they represent opportunities to gain greater learning. I ask you to keep an open mind as we travel this path of healing to bring peace back into your life on a permanent basis. And now let me speak to you about what I mean by the word solution. I once sat in on a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The words of a sign on the wall kept gnawing at me throughout that meeting. It read, Your best thinking got you here. I thought how true that is and how it applies to all of the circumstances of our lives. Our best thinking is exactly where all of our so-called problems exist. If we couldn't think about them, they would not exist. What we need is a change in thinking to realize that a connection to the divine is what eradicates our problems. You cannot send problems out of your life by attacking them or understanding them in more depth. Instead, you correct the error in your thinking that produces the problem in the first place. Once you bring a correction to the problem, it no longer has any validity, and it disappears. We correct these errors with the creation of a new spiritual delivery system. This is the basic introduction to the idea of having a spiritual solution available for every single problem. In the Yoga Aphorisms, Patanjali teaches that we are capable of reaching a state of awareness in which we can perform miracles. He counsels us to be unafraid of transcending the limitations imposed upon us by the material world. Patanjali's words cause me to truly think of myself as capable of living at a much higher level than I had ever even considered before. I felt urged to go beyond traditional ideas, which acted as obstacles to my union with God. Patanjali offered hundreds of specific suggestions and practices to reach the oneness or union with God, which he called yoga. Here are five aphorisms that can help you to gain access to your spiritual answers. I have arranged these five major themes in a way that I found useful for myself and I trust will be helpful to you. The first aphorism. The central act of ignorance is false identification. Patanjali describes ignorance as a basic misunderstanding of one's real nature. When we identify ourselves as our name or our title, our body, our possessions, achievements, or reputation, we are denying our true identity. What we are exploring here is ignorance defined as falsely identifying oneself as only of the material, ego-based world. Replace that false identification with imagining yourself eternally connected to a divine source. With this new identification comes an inner resolve to reorient yourself when faced with a problem. For example, if you want to stop a compulsive habit of overeating, begin by no longer identifying yourself as a body full of cravings. Instead, imagine yourself as pure, eternal peace and joy, always unified with God. Ignorance keeps you from genuinely experiencing pleasure or fulfillment via the senses because you clutch at what appears to provide it rather than seeking true happiness. To become an illumined soul, we must not conceptualize ourselves as our senses and all that they lust after. That is ignorance. 
We are not the objects of experience, but the experiencer itself. Seeing ourselves in this way provides us with a new tool for problem solving. Try it the next time you feel the impulse to overeat or consume a toxic substance, or even to spend time in painful grief over a loss. A dramatic example of this presented itself in the following letter and poem I received from Mary Lou Van Atta of Newark, Ohio. She is speaking directly to this idea of false identification as she writes of her ordeal and how she ultimately found a spiritual solution by remembering who she is rather than who she had falsely believed she was. Her letter goes like this. Dear Dr. Dyer, My son was murdered in a robbery attempt two years ago. Frankly, I thought I would never recover from my grief and loss. Amid all the clouds in my life and mind, I was somehow led once more to your books and tapes. I had read and listened to many in previous years, and while I had enjoyed them, I was too busy to truly listen. Upon going over them again, I realized one underlying truth in all of it. We are spirit in body, not a body with a spirit. I am once more a happy, healthy woman with a full steam ahead system. I will always feel my loss of Ross, but I know it is not the end of the story. I can wait. It's okay. Again, thank you. Sincerely, Mary Lou Van Etta. With Mary Lou's permission, I include the poem she wrote. It summarizes this first ancient radical idea. The central act of ignorance is not being ill-informed, but in falsely identifying yourself as your form. She calls her poem, I Am. The I that is me, you cannot see. You see only the form that you think is me. This form that you see will not always be, but the I that is me lives eternally. The spiritual journey does not consist in arriving at a new destination where a person gains what he did not have or becomes what he was not. It consists in the dissipation of his ignorance concerning himself and life and the gradual growing of that understanding which begins with spiritual awakening. The finding of God is a coming to one's own self. Patanjali's second aphorism. The mind of the truly illumined is calm because the peace of God within all things is known, even within the appearance of misery and disease. This second aphorism brings to mind the adage that the three truly difficult things to do in life are returning love for hate, including the excluded, and saying, I was wrong. If it requires stillness to know God, then we need to be in a place of loving calmness in order to be able to have God's assistance in problem solving. But how do I get to that place of calmness? I believe you can move into that state of knowing God by intentionally choosing calmness in moments of anxiety or fear. Yes, you can choose to be calm at any moment by reminding yourself that you are no longer choosing to live by your conditioned past. Our conditioning has led us to the error of thinking of ourselves in terms of finite beings. James Carsey, in his book Finite and Infinite Games, describes a world of finite games in which winners and losers, rules, boundaries, and time are all extremely important. In the world of finite games, titles, acquisitions, and prestige are of paramount significance. Being identified with losers in the finite game is frightening and dangerous. The ultimate loss, of course, is death. There is also the infinite game, which you can begin to play if you so choose. In this game, there are no boundaries. The forces that allow the flowers to grow cannot be tamed or controlled. The purpose of the infinite game is to get more people to play, to laugh, to love, to dance, and to sing. The infinite player speaks from the heart and knows that answers are beyond words. This is not to imply that players of the infinite game cannot also play finite games. The choice is to play mostly infinite games, but while playing the finite games, refusing to take them seriously. Others may think you are serious, but you know better. You know. You see your world in the terms of an infinite game. You will smile more frequently. You will feel serene. You will access spiritual solutions. The third aphorism of Patanjali. Sin is non-existent. There are only obstacles to one's ultimate union with God. Most of us grew up believing that a sin was an act of disobedience or ingratitude toward a God who is both separate and punitive. 
behavior which religion has taught us is sinful is conduct which is away from God. This, according to Patanjali, is not a reason to immerse ourselves in guilt and use up life energy attempting to somehow make amends. Rather, it should be viewed in the context of an obstacle that we have yet to overcome. The concept of being a sinner is an image of self-contempt and guilt, while the concept of encountering an obstacle is empowering. We have been trained to think in terms of sin and punishment. The empowering way is to view trials as lessons and opportunities to choose differently. The sinner, filled with guilt, becomes immobilized and remains in passive inertia. When we view the sinful behavior as an obstacle to a higher level of awareness, we can still take responsibility by asking ourselves, what is the lesson for me, and what can I do to avoid this the next time? If you have violated any of the commandments which you hold on to as law, if you have stolen, cheated, or lied, or coveted, or even physically harmed another, try viewing these actions as obstacles to your spiritual union with all that you truly are and can become. Even if you have done irreparable wrong to someone through uncontrolled greed or anger, you can still view this action in terms of obstacles to your union with God. Certainly you will feel remorse and do all that you can to right the wrongful acts. Sincere penance does not consist of perpetuating grief for wrongs, but in resolving to avoid in the future those deeds which call for remorse. Patanjali's Fourth Aphorism The person who is steadfast in abstaining from falsehood has the power to obtain for himself and others the fruits of good deeds without having to perform the deeds themselves. Normally, when we use the word truthful, we imply that a person's words correspond to the facts of which he speaks. Yet in this Yoga Sutra, steadfast in abstaining from falsehood means something quite apart from being factual. What is meant here is the practice of completely and wholly identifying oneself as a spiritual being, united with God at all times, and never confusing one's identity with the ego world of possessions, achievements, and reputation. In this state, we find ourselves gaining those fruits of good deeds. They will enable us to not only resolve our own problems, but those of others as well. Listen carefully to the words used in this sutra. Obtaining for yourself and others the fruits of good deeds without having to perform the deeds. Just what does this mean? Patanjali suggests that steadfast abstention from falsehood means that saying to someone, God bless you, means that the person is truly blessed because we are no longer capable of even dreaming an untruth. Similarly, this steadfast abstainer from falsehood can perform miraculous cures by simply telling a sick person that he is well. Thus, Patanjali suggests that when a person becomes perfected in truth, he literally gains control of truth. That person's being, along with their words and actions, allows them to obtain the fruits of good deeds without necessarily performing the deeds with their physical bodies. Now, I'm not offering you sainthood here in exchange for becoming a 100% truth teller. Rather, what I am proposing is that you open yourself to an idea which allows you to gradually remember your identity as a connected to God entity. The more steadfast you are in this regard, the more you will hear others say, I just feel better when she is around. I feel calm when he shows up. You literally raise the consciousness of those around you. We begin to see the fruits of good deeds appearing without having to work at it. Ultimately, we are close to the top and find that there are others just wanting to bathe a bit in our aura, so to speak. Let in this idea that you can access divine spiritual power to alleviate problems first for yourself and then for others. And finally, Patanjali's fifth aphorism, my favorite. When a person is steadfast in his abstention from harming others, then all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in his presence. Patanjali's statement, abstention from harming others, includes not only actual acts of harm, but also thoughts of jealousy, judgment, and injury. Steadfastly renouncing violence in thoughts and in all dealings with others creates an atmosphere wherein violence and enmity ceases to exist because it is not reciprocated. Any situation where you experience anger or even mild discomfort involves thoughts of enmity toward the other person or people. Other people will not feel enmity or anguish if you steadfastly abstain from having harmful thoughts toward them in the first place. Amazing! 
By you working at not having any judgments or harmful thoughts, those around you will be free of anguish also. I find it quite effective to use the following four words first internally, and then I say them out loud. They are, you're right about that. Not sarcastically, without rancor, I simply allow the other person to be right, which is all their ego really wants. This tool does not make the other person right. It merely allows someone to believe that they are, and it allows you to be steadfast in your abstention from harmful thoughts. As you practice allowing others to be right, you are beginning to live from your higher self rather than your ego. Eventually, it will be your authentic way of reacting to others even when they are being insulting. As you contemplate this idea of abstention from harmful thoughts or intentions, keep in mind that the reason you are not experiencing bliss at this precise moment is because you are focusing on what is wrong or missing. Problems are illusions of the material world. Solutions are attributes of your immersion in the world of spirit. As you face a problem, remind yourself that you created it with one mind and you will solve it with another. Spiritual problem solving ultimately means examining the entire concept of energy in a new way. Generally, we think of people with high energy in terms of enthusiasm and tirelessness. I am suggesting you think of energy in a context of vibration and movement. In this formulation, energy is the speed of an individual's energy field. The idea here is that a higher frequency will aid in problem solving, whereas a lower frequency will intensify problems. By increasing the speed at which you vibrate, you move into those frequencies I am calling spirit and away from those which are grounded in the material world of problems. Stephen Hawking, who may be the most scientifically enlightened mind on the planet today, has said, Apparently, common sense notions work well when dealing with material things like apples and or comparatively slow-moving things like planets, but they don't work at all for things moving at the speed of light. Hence, if you want to access and utilize the energy which vibrates at faster frequencies, you have to be able to shift your energy at appropriate times out of good old-fashioned common sense. Valerie Hunt, in her intriguing book, Infinite Mind, Science of the Human Vibrations of Consciousness, concludes, I can no longer consider the body as organic systems or tissues. The healthy body is a flowing, interactive, electrodynamic energy field. Motion is more natural to life than non-motion. Things that keep flowing are inherently good. What interferes with flow will have detrimental effects. Think of it this way. Everything is in a state of motion. We appear to be sitting still, but we know that our planet is spinning once every 24 hours, orbiting the sun once every 365 days, and moving through space at dizzying speeds. The same can be said of your body. It is a field of vibration and movement which appears solid and motionless. All information that you receive comes to you through your senses. Your eyes, for example, perceive light, which is really a very fast vibration of air and electromagnetic particles. Your ears perceive sound, which is a slower frequency of air vibrations. Were you to examine that information perceived by your eyes and ears before your senses pick them up, so to speak, you would see that those vibrations have no evil or disharmony inherent in them. They are simply problem-free vibrations. But when you take them in, suddenly you say, what I hear is a problem for me. What I see is evil and terrible, and so on. In other words, you took in those problem-free, faster energies and processed them in such a way as to create problems. Now for the big leap. Every problem that you face has a vibrational frequency and a movement to it. When problems collide with our slowed down solid world, we feel the conflict as an imbalance in our energy field. Thus, diseases of all kind represent a frequency and a movement just like everything else in the universe. Addictions too have a frequency or movement. Fear, stress, and anxiety, these are all frequencies. I believe we all have the potential to learn to increase the speed of our vibrations. In the slowest vibrations, we have illness and disharmony. In faster but still slow vibrations, we have ordinary human awareness. Thought and spirit are found in the fastest vibrations. For the purpose of explanation only, I have assigned an arbitrary figure representing the frequency speed. 
A equals 10,000 cycles per second, B equals 20,000 cycles per second, and C is 100,000 cycles per second. Consider first your physical health, where most of your time is spent attempting to reach point B, where you will feel okay because you have an absence of symptoms. Between point A and point B is where you take medicine, consult medical practitioners, and generally strive to get to a point where you just feel okay. Point C represents super health. You can do 500 sit-ups, run a marathon, and be toxin-free. Hypothetically, disease materializes at a very low energy frequency. Ordinary human awareness is what we call a normal frequency, and super health represents a balanced, fast vibration which has the ability to counteract disease frequencies. This can also be applied to your emotional state. At A, we find fear, anxiety, anger, and mental disease. At point B, your emotional well-being is stable and you feel all right, but any dramatic shift in circumstances or the behaviors of others could send you back into that frenzied world of worry and fear and guilt and depression and so on. Point C symbolizes perfect emotional health. Here you know that no one can interfere with your bliss. The actions and opinions of others have no unpleasant effect on your emotional state. Realistically, the movement from A to C is a shift in energy frequencies which you can cultivate and choose. When you speed your energy up, what you consider to be accidents and misfortunes are simply gone. In these faster vibrational frequencies, you are able to invoke intuition, insight, and other potentials which are dormant when you're in ordinary human awareness. There is one more element on this A, B, C continuum which I'm speaking about that plays a significant role in ending problems by accessing spiritual guidance. I'll call the third element in this example consciousness. At point A, the lowest level is ego consciousness. At this frequency, you resonate with an inner view that you are separate from everyone else and in competition with the rest of the world. You are absorbed in self-importance and validate yourself on the basis of what you have, what you do, and what others think of you. Ego consciousness is a very slow frequency in which you feel distinctly separate from spirit. As you progress to average human consciousness, you reach point B on this continuum. Point B I call group consciousness. Here you identify yourself on the basis of what groups you have chosen to align yourself with or been assigned to as a result of your birthplace, your ethnic identity, or your cultural label. In group consciousness, you have the frequency of awareness that categorizes life with phrases like, I am male, you are female. I am old, you are young. I am Italian, you are Chinese. I am Christian, you are Muslim. I am white, you are black. I am conservative, you are liberal. There are millions of these. On and on the groupings go, pigeonholing everyone into a frequency where conflict resolution is accomplished by determining who is right, stronger, better, or whatever. Wars are the outcome of group consciousness. Ancient enmities continue to flourish because of geographic boundary disputes, religious traditions, cultural practices, and so on. Every time you find yourself labeling others or yourself, you're setting up a potential problem. It becomes you against whoever is in the other group. Illness becomes a battleground when you must fight that which is invading the territory that you call my body. Lack of prosperity is due to others having more of what you want. Point B, group consciousness, is a step up from A, ego consciousness. However, point B still keeps you squarely in the middle of a life that is not peaceful or able to nullify problems. At this frequency, having problems is considered a normal function of living. As you approach point C on the consciousness scale, you reach a place that I call unity or God consciousness, where separation is unknown. You see no divisions, and you know that you are connected to everyone and all living creatures. In this state of unity consciousness, you no longer view your life circumstances as problems. As you explore the presence of spirit in your life as a faster, more complex energy frequency, consider that the highest levels of the mind contain the capacities of insight, imagination, creativity, and spiritual consciousness. The mind is a higher construct and it can be thought of as infinite. It is your mind, which indeed may be separate from your brain, that you are going to train to move at a faster frequency so as to bring spiritual solutions to your problems. Think about what it is like to be around people 
who seem to possess these highest capacities of the mind. A person of deep insight who touches your soul with his words and ignites feelings of love and appreciation is vibrating at a faster energy frequency. Deep insights do not have to be in esoteric fields such as quantum physics. I recall talking with a professional football player who had great insight in how to construct defenses against passing formations. I knew that he was experiencing life in his realm from a higher frequency. People who know how to be peaceful and loving regardless of the outer circumstances appear to have greater insight into how to live their daily life. They can have a profound effect on those whom they encounter. As you begin to consider this idea of faster vibrations being synonymous with spirit, remind yourself that we live in a world of invisible energy that we all take for granted. Think of electricity, radio and television signals, microwaves, fax machines, cellular telephones. We know that we can send radio waves out into the atmosphere, bounce them off satellites, scramble and unscramble them, and receive information from the waves. As we increase the frequency of these waves of energy, we can send them to distant planets and perhaps, perhaps, all the way to God and back. Isn't that what prayer is when you get right down to it? An invisible signal sent between your minefield and the universal minefield which you must be connected to. Research has shown that people who pray and are prayed for have higher incidences of recovery. Ponder this idea of faster vibrations being associated with spirit and spirit being the source of all problem solving. When you live persistently and permanently in the lower vibrational frequencies of material consciousness, you are not able to participate in the realm of transcendent ideas, insight, knowing, and pure creativity. Disease frequencies can invade your body when you live in a continual non-spiritual state of being angry, fearful, envious, judgmental, and worried. These lower vibrations are inherent in virtually all of the life circumstances that we call problems. The emotional states of fear, worry, anger, envy, greed, jealousy, guilt, and hatred are the lower frequency reactions that we implement in response to the circumstances and events of our lives. It is only when you elect to move beyond those slower, lower energy vibrations that you will eliminate problems that are associated with the material world of the senses. I've always loved the way a great Indian saint of the 19th and early 20th centuries responded to his devotees when they ask him how they could rid themselves of their lower energies. In the springtime, Vivekananda replied, observe the blossoms on the fruit trees. The blossoms vanish of themselves as the fruit grows. So too will the lower self vanish as the divine grows within you. The apples do not get into a deep conflict with the blossoms that are in their designated space on the branches of the tree. There is no anger, no battle between the fruit and its blossoms. As the fruit grows, the blossoms disappear. Everything in this material world of form is in a constant state of change and ultimately will be gone. But there is also the world of the changeless that we call God. And it is this unchanging spirit that will transform those things that you call problems. The cast of characters that create the illusory problems include fear, worry, guilt, vanity, anger, envy, greed, gossip, hypocrisy, hate, shame, jealousy, and particularly self-centeredness. If you've gotten this far with me in this recording, I believe that you have a pretty good idea about how these low energy vibrations of the mind work. You know when they are present, and you know how you feel when you allow them in your daily life. This leads us to the final awareness and that is that you can negotiate the presence of factors in your life to increase your frequency of vibrations. It is the fear of being divine that most often interferes with bringing spiritual energies into one's life. In order to be able to commune with the divine, you must be tuned into that frequency. You cannot tune into an FM radio station while you have the setting on AM. Certainly the higher frequencies of FM are out there playing away, but if you're not tuned into them, you will conclude that they're unavailable. You must therefore be more godlike and less materialistic in order to access and use spiritual energy to nullify and eliminate your problems. When you concentrate on these ways of being in your life, you begin the process of changing from one energy form to another. And you discontinue giving energy to the things you don't want or believe in in your own heart. 
A spiritual solution truly awaits everything you will ever think of as a problem. Keep in mind the central principle that guides your lifetime in this material universe. As you think, so shall you be. Once you understand fully that what you think about is what expands, you start to get real careful about what you think about. I've heard it said that a rock pile ceases to be a rock pile the moment a person contemplates it, bearing within them the image of a cathedral. How you look upon the world and the images you have within you determine what you will get in your life. People who we deem to be successful or happy or fully functioning are those who are able to attract into their lives what they would like to have. And the reverse is true as well. People who are unsuccessful, unhappy, or laden with problems are essentially unable to attract into their lives what they would like to have. Let's deal with those two groups in order. The successful people in the first group have a tendency to do the following four things. First, they express their desires. Successful, problem-free people have no hesitancy to say out loud what it is that they would like to manifest into their lives. They are, first of all, able to wish for a solution. I wish I could quit drinking. I would love to get that raise. I really would like to lose this excess weight. I really want to get along better with my children. This is the beginning phase. I call it the wish phase. And it is in the expression of a desire that successful people are led to the second phase. They are willing to ask. This involves an awareness that they are not alone, that a divine source is something they are at all times connected to, and that this source will provide them with sustenance and answers if they will only ask. Ask and you shall receive. It's not an empty phrase. It is an admonition from the scriptures to elicit divine support in removing obstacles to your highest good. It seems as though the process of asking is one in which we surrender our own sense of self-importance. It is this surrendering process itself that leads to the next way that successful people act. They state an intention. In this phase, they begin the process of taking full responsibility for creating their world the way they really want it to be. They will not entertain any doubts about their ability to solve any problem. I will absolutely lose the weight. I will not have arthritis move into my body. I intend to manifest prosperity into my life. I will not be pushed around by him any longer. Highly successful people are those who have a knowing about resolving problems and they are not focused on proving their point to anyone. And the fourth and final quality of the inner energy system of those who we perceive as problem solvers or successful is they have a hardening of the will. I often refer to this as having passion for what you would like to attract into your life to resolve your problems. When successful people harden their will, they become immune to outside forces which might attempt to dissuade them from their inner passion. In fact, they actually use the negative external pressures to remind themselves of their commitments. Perhaps the single most powerful force that you can master is a burning desire to achieve your inner objective. A burning desire is like having an inner candle flame that never even flickers, though the very worst goes before you. I recall reading about President Carter's agreement between the two bitter rivals, Israel and Egypt, at Camp David in 1978. President Carter had a vision that he would not allow to be blurred, though the obstacles were seemingly insurmountable. The president himself, night after night, went back and forth between the lodgings of Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin in order to reach an agreement. There's a glorious photograph of Sadat, Carter, and Begin shaking hands and celebrating the Camp David Accords. A spiritual solution to this massive social problem was brought about because of the burning desire of President Carter. This same hardening of the will when applied to the resolution of any problem you can envision in your own life will result in a spiritual solution as well. Now I am going to focus on how you can stop giving energy to the things you don't want and the things you don't believe in. But why would anyone, let alone you, want to give energy to what you don't want and what you don't believe in? Let's go back briefly to those seven little magic words, as you think, so shall you be. This universal law applies both ways. When you put your thought energy on your intentions with passion, 
you ultimately will act upon those thoughts and you are bound to attract what you are thinking about into your life. This law also works to keep you from attracting solutions for your problems into your life. How does this work? Your mind is active all day long with some 60,000 separate thoughts. Examine those thoughts. How many of them are on what you don't want? With my luck, it'll never work out. This cold is getting worse each day. The deal will probably fall through. These meals will add 20 pounds to my waist alone. Quitting smoking is so hard. It'll probably rain and ruin the outing. You begin to get the idea? If your thoughts are on what you don't want, no matter how much you abhor the thought of what you don't want materializing into your life, you will act upon those thoughts and more of what you don't want will keep showing up. Here's how to change this old habit. When you find yourself thinking a thought that focuses on what you don't want, no matter how insignificant it might be, stop right there and silently ask yourself, what do I want? That is, instead of thinking that your arthritis is going to get worse, which is precisely what you don't want, then change the thought to an intention. This arthritis is going to disappear from my life completely. Eventually, slowly but surely, you will begin to act upon this new intention, which is a faster energy, and this new intention will become your reality. You will do whatever you have to do to avoid suffering with your arthritis. You will not complain about it because you are no longer thinking of it as a problem. And miracle of miracles, your body, which is a system of energy, will react to your thoughts as well. But more important, you will be putting your energy on solutions. For instance, in a parking situation, your thoughts shift from, there will likely be no place to park, to, I'm looking for my parking place. Suddenly, you've stopped looking for no place to park, and the energy changes to accommodate you. The secret lies in the continuous reminder to yourself to first stop the outward verbal expression of what you don't want, second catch yourself and examine the thought behind that expression, and finally shift to an intention of what you will be creating for yourself, even if you don't know how you will create it, because ultimately you will access higher and faster universal powers to provide you with the solutions. Here's another reason why it is so difficult for people to become problem eliminators and attract into their lives what they want. It is very easy to spend your energy on the circumstances of your life or on what is. Even if you detest the circumstances of your life, if you place your energy on what it is that you despise, you will act on those thoughts and those conditions which you despise will continue to manifest into your life. This is one of the most troubling energy areas to change, largely because you have very likely been surrounded by people who complain and whine about their life circumstances. Let's say you have very little money and you label yourself as poor. How much time do you spend thinking and talking about being poor, complaining about the circumstances under which you are forced to live, whining about the shortage of money? Keep this statement in mind if you are in this category of scarcity consciousness. You cannot manifest prosperity from thoughts of, I hate being poor. What is required of you is a shift from the energy of what is onto the energy of what you want and what you intend to create. Every time your thoughts are on the circumstances of your life which you dislike, shift to what you would like to experience as your present circumstances, and then make the big leap to higher spiritual energy by visualizing what you intend to create. This applies to everything in your daily life that you call a problem. You cannot manifest thin from thoughts of, I hate being fat. You cannot manifest purity from, I despise being an addict. You cannot manifest health from, I abhor being sick. In each of those assertions of what you dislike, you are giving of your thoughts to create more of the same. On the other hand, if you put your inner energy on your preferred self-picture, Hold that vision as an intention, post your perfect weight in as many places as possible, and send love to yourself, surrendering to higher divine guidance to walk with you on your path to your ideal weight. You will act upon the new intentions, and you'll have brought a higher energy spiritual solution to your weight status. If your energy, in the form of your thoughts, is on the illnesses or discomforts of your body, your body itself will react to those thoughts. As Norman Cousins put it, the greatest force in the human body is the natural drive of the body to heal itself. But that force is not independent of the belief system. Everything begins with belief. 
Health is not something that you need to acquire. It is something you already have. Don't interfere with it, particularly with your beliefs. It is important to recognize that this applies to all of your relationships as well. If any human relationship you are in is unsatisfactory in any way, be certain that you are not compounding the problem by continuing to give energy to the aspects that you dislike. For example, when someone says they don't get along with their parents or their spouse, they are defining the relationship in terms of what they dislike. It is impossible to live with her, there's always arguing, there's no respect for me, and so on. If you find you do this, Begin to raise your energy level and remind yourself that relationships are exclusively experienced in your thoughts. Shift those thoughts upwards in frequency to the level of spiritual consciousness and bring that to the relationship. For you, the person doing the upgrade in vibration, the relationship will change regardless of how anyone else reacts and also the problem in the relationship will disappear. How many times have you heard the words, I can't help it, this is the way I was taught to do this? or words to this effect. Many of the problems that we face are due to our being attached to the way we've always done things. Suppose you have a mindset which has produced a host of failures. These problems might involve a series of failed relationships in which you end up continuing to feel victimized. Or they might be the result of addictive behavior that persists despite having changed the substances you've craved over the years. Or you may have a pattern of being wasteful with your finances. Or perhaps you've experienced one chronic illness after another, even though the places on your body take turns being the troublesome spots. We are subjected to many illusions in our daily life. The greatest one is the one which keeps us trapped in giving our energy to what has always been. This illusion is characterized by the belief that the past is the reason why I'm continuing to believe in these ways. I've referred to the wake of a fast-moving boat. The wake is the trail that is left behind, and nothing more. The wake cannot drive the boat. The wake of your life does not drive your body. But the present moment energy that you put into the events of your past, explaining or excusing your continuing problems, does affect your life today. And that is the source of those problems. The second factor that keeps us producing those unwanted problems is our love of wallowing around in the dramas of our past and using our inner energy to remind ourselves, and anyone who will listen, of all that created the problems we experience today. No one said it better or more succinctly than William Shakespeare when he reminded us, what's done is done. Many of your so-called problems are present today because you are caught up in your personal history. Know in your heart that everything in your wake had to take place in order for you to be where you are today. And what is my evidence for making such a statement? Everything did take place, period. Rather than cursing it, bless it and bring love and acceptance to it. There's no shortage of folks out there who will let you know how they expect you to think, feel and behave. Now suppose that you are filled with deep resentment about how those people are continually reminding you of their expectations for you. The antidote for resolving this problem is a spiritual one. You must learn to increase your energy vibrations from the low range of anger and resentment to the higher ranges of kindness, love, and forgiveness. The moment that you no longer react with that low energy, the illusion of your problem will disappear. I observed an 18-year-old friend of one of our daughters talking to his mother on the telephone. As he hung up the phone in frustration, he said, She makes me so angry. She's always telling me what to think and where to go and how to do things. He was obviously upset. I told him he had two choices. He could either continue to practice being right or practice being kind. If you insist on being right, you will argue, get frustrated, angry, and your problems will persist with your mom, I explained. If you simply practice being kind, you can remind yourself that this is your mom. She's always been that way. She will very likely stay that way but you're going to send her love instead of anger when she starts in with her routine. A simple statement of kindness such as, that's a good point, Mom, I'll think about it, and you have a spiritual solution to your problem. When you need to be right, you stay invested in the world of low energy. When you practice being kind, you bring a spiritual essence to the illusion of a problem, and amazingly, it just disappears. Now you will hear about three energy fields and ways of keeping them uncontaminated. The first energy field is your immediate energy body, which I also refer to as etheric or faster. From a standing position, 
Extend your arm forward and mentally note the most distant point where your fingers extend. Now imagine your arm extending straight above your head to a point over your body and then behind you and beneath you as well. You now have an image of a field of energy which continuously surrounds your body. I call this field your fast energy body, which is inseparable from your solid and visible slower energy body. Using your imagination, take a moment now to visualize this field of faster energy with its edges or boundaries around you. When another person, particularly a stranger, crosses your boundary, you immediately feel as if you've been invaded. You move back instinctively to create a safer distance. Why? Because your energy body feels the invasive force and alerts you with a state of discomfort. If someone remains in your energy body field for an extended period of time, they begin to affect your entire being with their energy, bringing you down if you feel out of sync with them, and raising you up if they resonate to a higher energy vibration than you. I refer to the second energy field as your broader environmental energy field. To get a sense of this physical energy field, think about your energy field extending into your home, your workplace, your family, and your community. The vibrational pattern of this energy field is your broader environmental energy field. This energy field, in which your solid body walks and talks and sleeps and works and plays, is impacted by the energy frequency of whoever enters it. Now I want you to think of a field of energy so immense that you cannot even create imaginary boundaries for it. I call this the mind field energy. Your thoughts and the thoughts of others interact in your mind field in such a way as to raise or lower your frequency of vibration. When the thoughts and feelings of others impinge upon your mind energy field, there will be one of two results. Either your energy field will be increased, as is said to have happened when Buddha and Jesus entered a village, just their presence in the village and nothing more would raise the consciousness of those around them. Or, your energy field will be decreased and consequently become contaminated. The way others think and how they radiate out their thought energy can impact you. But it is not only people who impact your energy fields. Noise levels, air quality, food purity, all touch and affect your fields of energy. What you may not realize is that you play a potent role in keeping your energy fields clean and uncontaminated, and that you also have a salubrious and cleansing effect on the energy field of those around you. Hopefully, you will be motivated to begin implementing a new approach that will clear all of your energy fields and maintain a state of clarity, free of energy patterns that contaminate your life in any way. Your energy field cleanup project encompasses the three energy field categories that I have just enumerated. The first field is your personal or immediate one. Keep in mind the extension of your arm's length energy body that is all around you. This field of energy radiates outward and is impacted by two factors. One factor is the relative harmony of your body from within, and the other factor is what you allow to impact your body from without. For an examination of the first factor, you need to answer these questions. How do you treat this body, which is the living organism that sends out the waves of electromagnetic energy? What foods do you use to replenish and replace it with? What toxins do you absorb? How much peaceful rest do you provide for it? Do you exercise it regularly? Is your emotional state calm? Do you meditate to bring yourself into harmony with God? Your body must be loved. It is your home and must be cleansed of all junk. Your body is not your enemy. You do not need to get free of your body in order to access spiritual guidance. This perfectly functioning machine called your body knows what is needed, where it is needed, and how to prioritize those needs in times of crisis. You control this marvelously complex instrument that is your home through your thoughts. The second factor that impacts your immediate field of energy is what you allow to impact your body from without. What kinds of people do you allow into your immediate space? When you allow toxic people into your immediate energy field, you will find that your feelings of well-being diminish. You must say goodbye, albeit with unconditional love, to anyone who pollutes your life space with slowed down energy. Or, you must be prepared to stave off the intrusion of lower energy people first by recognizing it and then neutralizing it by radiating stronger energy yourself. The problem with attempting to continually be a neutralizer is that the effort required often exhausts you and that level of fatigue makes you susceptible to the lower energies. 
If someone brings anxiety, shame, depression, fear, whining, complaining, apathy, stress, worry, anger, guilt, or any of the multitude of what I call lower energy patterns, they are inviting you to join in their misery and load your life up with the problems that they live with every day. Resolve to remove yourself from any toxicity that threatens the purity of your life space. When you feel yourself being breached, take immediate action, first by recognizing what is happening, and then moving in counteraction. Consciously send out thoughts of kindness and love. Remove yourself in a conflict-free way from the invading energetic forces. Anyone who you allow to be a regular visitor in your body energy field must come with love, peace, and the higher spiritual energies. Now let's move on to decontaminating the second energy field. A friend who has teenage children told me about trying to deal with a conflict with one of his teenage daughters. She was staying out all night, hanging out with people of questionable character, and under the influence of drugs and alcohol. He said that the energy field of their home was being contaminated regularly. He and his wife would spend hours debating what course to take, and the other children suffered when arguments ensued. In this physical environment of low energy, the disrespect, angry outbursts, alcohol, drug consumption, worry, and sadness were all contaminating the whole family. Then, in the midst of a confrontation in which the daughter was obviously distraught and also ashamed at having stayed out late again, she suddenly stopped her angry outburst and said, Could I have a hug from you? He immediately stretched his arms out and held her, and that entire relationship and her conduct began to move into the higher frequencies of spirit. He said he realized in that moment that it was not only about him and his daughter, it was between him and God. Could he extend love in the face of anger and disrespect? Could he be loving to someone who was defying him? Was there a place within him that could be reached by the higher energies of love and compassion, even when he felt the contaminating effects of those lower and slower vibrations? It was not about me and my daughter, he said. It was between me and God. This lesson is the most important one you can learn in keeping your broader environmental energy field free of contaminants. Empty of ego and affiliated with the spiritual principles of love, you get closer and closer to God. When you begin to radiate spiritual qualities, you will impact the energy field of your immediate surroundings more than you may have realized. Furthermore, you will keep your own energy field less contaminated, and you will prevent conflicts merely by your raised spiritual consciousness. When you feel that your family, social, and work environments are poisoned in any way by the negativity and slowed-down energy of others, you can do something about it. I turn to Mother Teresa to offer you a way to improve those negative environmental fields. The following eight points are from Mother Teresa of Calcutta, followed by my comments on each of her suggestions. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. When you notice low energy conduct of others, rather than allowing it to impact and infect your immediate surroundings, send them a silent blessing. When you forgive them, you choose to not be impacted in a negative manner. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. Your field of energy is protected from contamination by kindness. Kindness that comes from your heart will suffice to keep you from being dragged down into an energy field infected by false accusations. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. The world is filled with people who are looking for occasions to be offended. Your success at anything is enough to trigger such a reaction in others. Keep your energy field pristine by focusing on what you know to be your divine purpose, and by doing so, the universe will support and sustain you with what is labeled success. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. Your energy field will remain uncontaminated as long as you know that you are being honest and frank. This may attract others at the lower energies of dishonesty and cheating to try to take advantage of you. But you will not become their victim because you will have the sense of inner peace that characterizes higher and faster spiritual energy. What you spend years building, someone may destroy overnight. Build anyway. 
When you eat a banana, the goal is not to finish it, but to enjoy each bite while nourishing yourself. Everything in the material world that is built will ultimately be destroyed. Build not in fear of having it destroyed, but because you are giving expression to the infinite spirit within. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. Happiness is an inside job. You don't get it from anyone or anything. You bring it to everyone in every event of your life. Others may be jealous, find fault with you, and say terrible things about you, but you are free to choose happiness for yourself. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Like being happy, doing good is something that you do as an expression of your invisible spiritual essence. Stop looking for the approval and gratitude of others as your reason to do good. Ego, rooted in the material world, urges you to do what you do so that you will be remembered and rewarded as if life were a contest. Remind yourself to give love and to do good because that is who you are and for no other reasons. And finally, Mother Teresa's last suggestion. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got, anyway. The best, as used by Mother Teresa, implies your highest, most sacred self. Others may attempt to contaminate your energy field by demanding more of you, or by criticizing you, or even by ignoring your efforts. When you return to your highest self, you are independent of those opinions almost instantly and problems of feeling unappreciated or non-existent. Give the world your spirit and detach from the outcome of your efforts, and your energy field becomes less and less contaminated. Your intellect might protest and attempt to convince you that mind fields and silent communication of energy are nonsense. But once you see this at work, you'll know. I've seen it at work over and over in my own life when I'm able to consciously project love, understanding, and compassion to those in my immediate life space, I feel the shift in energy. My wife, Marceline, is a master at this. Marceline has delivered seven babies without any drugs, each time creating the kind of energy I describe here. Moreover, she is now a doula, a woman who assists others in delivering their babies in an atmosphere where fear and anxiety are replaced with a calm, loving feeling of thankfulness for being able to participate in such a miracle. The closer you come to being in a dynamic state of grace in your thoughts and refusing to be in the fields of those who are projecting lower energy thoughts, the closer you come to being in God's minefield. The following principles represent my personal view on how your mind and your subsequent behavior can move you from toxic energy levels of the material world into the level of spirit wherein lies the solution to any and all problems. Practice the presence of spirit. Practice awareness of the impossibility of being outside of the omnipresent spirit. Some ways of doing this are to remind yourself when you first awaken that this is a day that God will be with you at all times. Every meal you eat, be mindful of what it took for that food to reach your plate. When you make a phone call, drive in your car, or enter your workplace, begin to have this God realization. As you practice being mindful of the presence of the divine, invisible spirit, you will notice a greater sense of peace, a stronger feeling of being safe and secure, a knowing that you are healthy and living from an inner sense of integrity. These feelings result from simply silently practicing, and I emphasize silently. No preaching and converting others to think as you do. Simply realize the presence of your source from which you are never truly separated, except in your own mind. Your mind is the substance of all matter. Take a look at your right hand. Would you describe it as intelligent? No, because intelligence is the mind that directs your hand to move, to grasp, to make a fist, or wave goodbye. Your hand responds to the directives of your mind. Now think about every other organ of your body, your heart, liver, spleen, all of which were created to act in accordance with the central divine intelligence within them. If you so elect, your entire body will respond to the directives of your mind. Direct, insist, demand if you must that your mind be in harmony with the divine mind and your energy will go from slow to fast, from material to spiritual, from problems to solutions. Mortal sense needs to yield to make room for spiritual awareness. 
When confronted with a problem, stop in the middle of it and remind yourself that God is on the field and that you can surrender to that realization. I received a letter from a woman who was diagnosed with cancer and given only a few months to live. She decided to keep this information from everyone she knew, including her husband and children. She rented a cabin in the northern Minnesota woods and spent every day silently yielding her mortal sense and opening herself to spiritual guidance. The days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, with every day devoted to communing silently with God and releasing her attachment to her body and the cancer that had invaded it. She began to feel stronger as she no longer identified herself with her body. When she returned to her home, she never again even visited a medical facility. Today she thrives some nine years after her terminal illness diagnosis. The commitment to yield her mortal sense and allow the calm, peaceful, serene, loving presence of God to handle the cancer was what she intuitively felt was her pathway to healing. Send love to and pray for your enemies. Harboring anger and hatred toward anyone guarantees that you remain in low energy fields where problems will continue to crop up in your life. I suggest that you examine every relationship in which you feel judgmental thoughts of anger and hatred. Replace those thoughts with energies of acceptance, kindness, and love. You will have to make a personal commitment to, first of all, notice what you are feeling, and then exercise your ability to choose to send love. When your heart becomes pure, your enemy becomes your friend, or even more significantly, your teacher. Your worst enemies are your greatest teachers because they allow you to examine the emotions of anger and revenge and then to transcend them. They give you the exact tools you need to elevate yourself to the spiritual energies that provide your solutions. God is not withholding. Imagine for a moment that you know a person who has stored away everything you want or need for your happiness but refuses to let you have them unless you do his bidding, ask properly, and behave as he wants you to. Furthermore, this person can heal you of the disease, but allows you to suffer for now, and maybe will consider healing you at some future date. This would not be a very nice person, let alone a very nice God. Is this the kind of withholding God that you imagine the spiritual energy to be? In the scriptures it clearly says, And everything I have is yours. These six little words may be the secret you've been looking for to raise your awareness to a spiritual level. Whatever solution you seek for whatever problem you may have is available to you in this moment. It is in you, not in some mythical Santa Claus-like being floating around in the heavens dispensing goodies to some and baddies to others. You are always connected to this universal source of present moment energy. You are not being punished. Just as God does not withhold, God does not punish. The idea that God could be punitive is inconsistent with spiritual awareness. It is a mistake of the ego or the intellect to believe there is evil for which God must punish you. You correct an error by bringing truth to it. The idea that God will condemn you is not consistent with a God of forgiveness. You believe either in one power or two. The power of one is the power of love. Evil exists first as a thought of non-good or non-God, and then it is that thought which is acted upon. But it's all an error. If it's not good, it's not of God. And if it's not of God, it can't exist, since everything is of the one power we call God. You can correct all of the errors of your belief in separation from God by bringing that higher loving energy to those areas of your life that are plagued with problems. They are not punishments. Rather, think of them as errors to be corrected. God is not an overcoming power. There's no reason for you to sit around and wait to be favored with a spiritual experience because most likely it is not going to happen that way. The simple truth is that by thinking good, healing, loving thoughts, you can produce the good, healing, loving results. And conversely, by thinking evil thoughts, you can produce evil results. The power of God is a creative, sustaining power. Resist not evil means to not give any credence to evil as a power in the first place. 
Once you embrace the idea of one power, you commune with that power and let go of the illusion that a power other than that of God created your problems. Divine love will meet every human need. Mary Baker Eddy is responsible for these words being printed on the wall of every Christian science church. Divine love will meet every human need. How is it possible to believe this? People continue to have many unmet needs in the presence of divine love. They feel divine love and still their problems and sicknesses persist. This statement does not imply, as many who wish for the resolutions to their problems assume, that divine love is out there doing it for you or to you. Divine love is something that you must express, and when you do, your every problem or need will be met. You cannot have God and have fear as well. Generally speaking, most people are afraid to become that which they can envision in their most glorious and perfect moments. Fear of your highest possibility keeps you from knowing God and living a life in which you can access spiritual solutions. Essentially, there are two overriding emotions, love and fear. And those two emotional states cannot be experienced simultaneously. Replace fear by simply allowing a feeling of love or the presence of God to reside right in that same ghostly spot where the fear was. Don't feel spiritual, be it. You don't wander around all day feeling moral or honest. You simply are a moral person. If you consciously felt moral, you would be broadcasting it all day. Instead, you simply are honest and moral, and your behavior comes from within you. The same is true of your spirituality. Being spiritual is not an emotional accomplishment to praise yourself for. It is your way of being with God that is as natural as your health, morality, or even your artistic sense. Trying to feel spiritual is not the same as being it. By simply recognizing your connection to God, and inviting that part of yourself to consciousness, you are raising your energy level to the level of spirit. But if you make yourself a pawn in a game of how mystical can I feel, you invite ego to begin to try to get more spiritual points than your opponents. It is that very elitist world of the lower vibrations that you want to leave behind. Don't try to feel spiritual. Just be it. God cannot be divided against God. God is an infinite power which cannot be fragmented or divided. That is, God cannot be available for some people and unavailable for others. God cannot be here one day and gone the next. He cannot be in anything that is evil and also be in that which is good. In defining God, all discussion disappears, and you have only the one all-knowing, all-good, all-loving presence. When you find yourself in duality, you are in the physical world where you perceive yourself as laden with problems and you seek solutions. Your ego insists the solution to being sick is to find health. The solution for scarcity is abundance and the solution to pain is pleasure. It is not God that is divided into good versus bad, disease versus health, it is you. The absolute way to health, prosperity, and love is in knowing that disease, scarcity, or evil never can be acknowledged as having power. If you ask God to heal you, you are acknowledging that God made you sick. When you ask God for special favors, you acknowledge a God power that kept those favors from you. Instead of seeking benefits or favors from God, remind yourself to commune with this eternal presence that is in you. Bring this presence to the illusions that are in your mind called problems. Harmony is your normal, natural state of being. A mind imbued with ignorance or error will keep the body in a constant state of disrepair and problems. Harmony is your natural state of being, because when you are natural, you are in the hands of the one loving presence called God. It is your mind that creates problems for you. Your mind has the power to steer you through this lifetime and make it a marvelous voyage. When you reach spiritual peace, your mind and body are the instruments through which God energy flows. At this consciousness, there is no limit to what can be revealed to you. As you become more aware of your divinity, you will discover your abilities to remove illusions of illness, scarcity, and evil. This harmonious relationship with spirit is your natural state of being. Our lacks come from failure to understand God's law. I have been able to see and visualize God's abundance in my life. I see it even before it arrives, but the knowing that I can make it arrive stems from my inner conviction that I am already connected to what only seems to be missing. Thus, when I pray, 
I never attempt to influence God, to ask for favors, or beg God to do something for me while I wait around and do nothing. Instead, I use prayer to open the gates of my soul to this divine presence. Resist not evil means giving up fighting your problems. I want to stress again the significance of removing force from your life as a way of achieving a problem-free life. When you become a fighter against anything, you join forces with that which created the problem in the first place. When Mother Teresa was asked during the Vietnam War, will you join our march against this war, she replied, no, I won't. But if you have a march for peace, I'll be there. When we put our collective energy on what we are for, bringing kindness and love to bear on our differences of opinions, the need to resist ends. It is only through a change in consciousness that our world will be transformed. This is true of your life and all of your problems as well. Hold no one or no thing in judgment. In the material world, we often find ourselves in conflict because of our opinions about right and wrong. You cannot bring spiritual harmony into problem resolution as long as you accept the idea that one side is right and the other is wrong. Letting go of judgments and simply finding a way of bringing non-judgmental harmony to a problem eliminates the ego's need to make someone wrong, which inevitably exacerbates the problem. One of the most compelling ideas I have personally learned regarding judgment is this. When you judge another person, you do not define them. You merely define yourself as someone who needs to judge. Just because you make an assertion that someone is stupid or cheap or arrogant or flighty or promiscuous does not define that person. It only says something in you is having a conflict with something outside of you. If judgment continues without seeking the source of the conflict within you, problems will continue unabated. Your own level of spiritual energy is immediately raised when you are able to resist that temptation to judge others as wrong and yourself as right. True nobility is not about being better than anyone else. It is about being better than you used to be. Knowing that you have just as much to teach me as I to teach you affirms for me that I am not better than any person out there on this planet. Yet at the same time, I know that I am better than I used to be. Much better. I am no longer dominated by my ego's need to be right, to accomplish and triumph. I now ask how may I serve before wondering what's in it for me. I teach meditation rather than medication, and I'm a better father, husband, and son than I once was. You must slow down to speed up your spiritual energy. Ironically, fast-paced, frantic activity is a very low, slow form of energy. When your mind and your body are in a constant state of worry and anxiety, meeting deadlines and scurrying to keep the next appointment, remember that in the world of physical form, the actual energy pattern is extremely slow. Hence the irony when you slow yourself down and emanate peaceful, tranquil thoughts, you actually send the anxiety and stress out of your life. Similarly, when you meditate, you bring God's silent love into your present moments. By slowing your mind and freeing it from the endless chatter of thoughts competing against other thoughts, you allow the fastest vibrations of spirit to enter. I have used a technique in traffic to slow my mind down and consequently allow the peace of God's fast vibrations to be present within me. When I am stopped at a red light, I usually choose to use this minute to still and stop my mind as well. I find that I can simply close my eyes, meditate for the prescribed stoppage time, and experience the peace of that moment. I have also discovered that there is almost always someone behind me who will give me a considerate wake-up honk to remind me that my meditation time is up. Here's one of the most famous prayers of all time. It's the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, upon which the remainder of this program is based. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying to self that we are born 
to eternal life. St. Francis of Assisi. I have detailed the principles involved in understanding that there is a spiritual solution to every problem. Now I would like to offer some practical applications of these principles based upon this famous prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, who lived in the 13th century. Each line provides a simple and perfect exercise to increase your energy level, thereby enabling you to experience your problems as illusions which dissolve when you bring the one power of spirit to them. It begins with becoming an instrument of peace. Consider the greatest saints who have ever walked among us. They are different from the rest of us in one unique quality. All they have to give away is peace. And what is this peace? It is the expression of the universal creative intelligence which winds its way in and through everything. I recall my friend Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 commander and the sixth man to walk on the moon, describing to me how he could cover the entire earth with his thumbnail from inside his capsule as he circled the moon. He had an epiphany in which he realized that this was an intelligent system of peace that we are all a part of as he saw millions of heavenly objects hurtling, spinning, and orbiting in perfect unison. Within each object, this same peaceful harmony exists. The most compelling aspect to all of this is that thy peace can become yours 100% of the time whenever you make the conscious decision that this is how you are going to live. Peace is the result of retraining your mind to process life as it is rather than as you think it should be. As simple as this sounds, this is the secret to being an instrument of God's peace. You do not seek peace by looking into the lives of others and wishing that they would change so that you could become more peaceful. Rather, you bring your peaceful countenance to the chaos you encounter and your presence soothes the outer turmoil. How do you do this? Memorize this line of the prayer and silently repeat it. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Those chaotic moments are times to remember that you will not gain your peace from anyone else and that you choose to bring peace to every life situation you encounter. The most important moments for cultivating this awareness are when someone is argumentative or irrational and you sense yourself falling into the pandemonium. Who are the people who seem to be able to push your buttons and send you into a frenzy? Your spouse, your children, your parents, a certain employee, your boss? I'm talking about the ones who really get to you. Anyone else might say the same thing and you're able to blissfully ignore them and even respond in your most spiritual and unconditionally loving tone saying, thank you for sharing. Obviously, those people do not present any threat to your being an instrument of peace. It is those button pushers, the ones who succeed in sending you into a state of frustration and turmoil with a simple look of disapproval or a frown who are your greatest teachers. That's right. These are your guides.